Hello and good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Benedict de Montlor, and I'm the president and CEO of World Monuments Fund. And I'm delighted to welcome you for this hybrid event. So those of you who are online, welcome. But I have to say I'm really delighted to be speaking not by myself in front of a screen, like we've been doing so many times over the past two years, and to have an actual audience to talk to. So thank you for those of you who are here, uh, despite the cold and all the uncertainties uh, of COVID. So uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Center for Architecture in New York for this 2021 World Monuments Fund Knoll Modernism Prize. More than a decade ago, World Monuments Fund launched the Modernism Prize with funding sponsor Knoll to raise awareness about the urgent threats to modern architecture. I have to say that Noel, who is presented here very well by Alana Stevens, who will speak after, uh, has been a visionary partner. And I also want to thank David Bright, who was really an architect of this prize. And I'm so delighted that you are able to be here to tonight. Noel has been visionary in championing public education on the value of modern architectural heritage through their funding sponsorship of this innovative modernism at risk program in 2006. And we are very grateful to have continued support from Noel in this important endeavor. Modern architecture that was once recognized for its bold and innovative designs often fall victims to deterioration, obsolescence, and public apathy. And this was very much the case of the place we are honoring tonight. We are delighted to, that the jury has chosen to honor John Puddick Associates for the Preston Bus Station uh, renovation in the United Kingdom. Um, this is an amazing story. In fact, it's a story uh, that has been associated with World Monuments Fund for a long time. In 2012, this place, the Preston Bus Station, was included in the World Monuments Watch as a response to the threat of demolition and to raise awareness about the significance of brutalist architecture in the United Kingdom. And this was very efficient, I guess not only our efforts of World Monuments Fund, but also all the effort of all the civil society organizations in the UK, because in 2015, a design competition was held by the building's new owners, the Lancashire C uh, County City Council, leading to the appointment of John Puddick Associates to restore the station. And their careful approach resulted not only in the meticulous restoration of the site that you're going to be able to admire through uh, incredible pictures uh, this evening, but also in renewing the expression of civic pride that the Preston bus station represented in its early days. And I have to say that we were delighted of this choice of the jury because it's a public facility, because it's about public transportation that is so important uh, today, and also because it is a history of resilience, really, civil society organization coming together to fight for this extraordinary architecture. And uh, as you know, community work is everything we stand for at World Monuments Fund. We were created 56 years ago with projects in Venice, in, in Ethiopia, in Easter Island, to really work with local communities everywhere to help them save and restore uh, the heritage and make it meaningful and bring value to the, to the current people living around it. And I think this is very much what's happening there in the UK. Uh, this year prize focused on sustainable and community-centered approach to adapting modern buildings and the restoration of Preston bus station as enhanced both the social and public benefit of the station. So we recognize the outstanding achievements of John Puttick Associates with this year prize. And by doing so, we really celebrate the power of preservation as a positive force in society. So uh, big, before I leave the floor to the other speakers, I would like to extend a warm welcome to John Puttick. I know until the end, you were not sure that you were going to be able to come to the UK, as we were not sure that we were going to be able to have this event partly in person. Um, so thank you for flying all the way uh, from uh, London to be here tonight. We are thrilled to welcome you. Um, I also want to take a moment to thank the Modernism Prize jury. As uh, I joined World Monument Fund two years ago, I got the opportunity to meet with them, and I have to tell you, they are so passionate about this prize. Like, all of them have a big sense of ownership 
about everything that has been accomplished, and the only thing we always talk about is how to make it more powerful, how to talk more about it, about all these amazing uh, restorations that have happened. So thank you to uh, Courtney Martin, as the director of the Yale Center for British Art, who is one of our newest uh, members, to Dietrich Newman, professor of the history of modern architecture and director of urban studies, the Department of History of Art and Architecture at Brown University. Jean-Louis Cohen, who is a Sheldon Solo Professor in the History of Architecture at the Institute of Fine Arts at NYU. Karen Stein, uh, who is a critic, architectural advisor, and executive director of the George Nelson Foundation. Mabel Wilson, who is also one of our new members, uh, who is the Nancy and George Rook Professor of Architecture, Planning and Preservation a professor in African-American and African diasporic studies and the director of the Institute for Research in the African-American Studies at Columbia University. Susan McDonald, uh, who is the head of Building and Sites at the Getty Conservation Institute, and thank you also for flying all the way from Los Angeles, as well as Theo Prodon, who is the president of Docomomo US and adjunct professor of historic preservation at Columbia University, and Pratt Institute. And of course, I want to thank Barry Bergdahl, who is a Mayor Shapiro Professor of Art History and Archaeology at Columbia University, and who is the Chair of the Modernism Prize, and this wouldn't really exist without him. And he's also the President of here, of this place. So thank you, Barry, for welcoming us in your walls. So um, thank you all. I will give the floor now to Aladna Stevens, President of NOAA, who has been amazing with her enthusiasm for this prize. And I wish you all a great evening. Thank you. I forgot she's French. I didn't double kiss. Um, thank you so much for those warm words. And good evening, everyone. How fun is this to be together? Thank you for those who are able to attend in person, as well as to those who are joining virtually. It is such an honor to be here representing Noel as we recognize the recipient of the 2021 World Monuments Fund Noel Modernism Prize. At Noel, we have been committed to modern design for over 80 years, believing that modernism is a powerful and inspiring force for good. And as you just heard, Recognizing that all too many modernist architectural masterpieces were being demolished or abandoned with our friend David, we proudly were a, a proud founding sponsor of the World Monument Fund Modernism at Risk program. And well over a decade ago, we launched this event, this prize, the Biennial World Monuments Fund Knoll Modernism Prize to honor contemporary architects and preservationists whose work ensures sustainable futures for at-risk modern heritage. Today at Knoll, we continue to use modern design in all that we do to connect people to their work, their lives, and their world. It is therefore gives me particular pleasure to recognize our winner this evening, John Puddock Associates, for the preservation of the Preston bus station in Preston, United Kingdom. The bus station literally connects people to their work, their lives, and their worlds for over five decades, so we feel a kinship. The Preston bus station, designed in 1968, and you'll learn much more in subsequent uh, speeches, is a historic piece of architecture, and since its first use, has elevated the experience of commuting. In great design, nothing more than elevating the experience of whatever the, ex whatever the moment is. With over 10,000 buses leaving the station every week, the building has been so much more than a station, as Benedict just said, it really was and is the center of city life. The restoration, while honoring the original design intent, was sure to prioritize people over vehicles. And with that, a wonderful result, not just a renewed experience, a renewed building, but a renewed sense of civic pride that I think we can all say is, is wonderfully important and what I believe is one of the most important results. But think about that experience. Imagine that you're in this building, you live in the United Kingdom, you're walking through the bus station and maybe you see someone that you haven't seen in two years. 
say hello to someone that you haven't bumped into in a while. Just think about that experience in the context of tonight and this time that we have all shared together the last couple years. We're so blessed to be together this evening, but there are still too many, too many who are isolated and disconnected. And so as we look forward, and design is, if nothing else, optimistic pursuit, public spaces that connect us to one another and are accessible to all are more important than ever. And as such, the Preston bus station is a true demonstration of how modernism is a means to social good. So congratulations to John Paddock Associates for your incredible restoration that will bring modern design to the masses for many years to come. And I would also like to thank, as we just heard, I wanna add my thanks to all of the nominees, all who submitted nominations for this year's prize. I also would like to recognize the Juris and the World Monument Fund itself. It is absolutely inspiring to see so many dedicated to conservation of modernism. The work, the advocacy, the education has already made an invaluable difference to so many individuals and communities around the world. And Preston, United Kingdom, is yet another recipient. So on behalf of everyone at Knoll and our new friends at Miller Knoll, congratulations and thank you to all. It does feel strange to be at a podium. Uh, good evening, and it is my pleasure to be the third to welcome you in my dual capacities of chair of the Center for Architecture this building in this place and of the WMF Knoll Modernism Prize Jury. The center is extremely proud to host this prize ceremony, this prize which is now in its seventh edition and its 12th or 13th year, and to be able to do so when we can offer you not only this space, which is itself a space of encounter and discussion about architecture, uh, but which currently has, I think, a very apropos exhibition that I hope you'll take a moment to discover, if I can advertise, uh, on the entry floor on Cairo Moderns. I think you make many discoveries up there. I want to thank Noel and the WMF, Alana Stevens, Benedict de Montlore, and so many others for their continued support and enthusiasm. It's also wonderful to see David Bright here this evening. Uh, for this incredible initiative. It has been my pleasure with my fellow jurors to meet every other year and survey the field of recently completed restoration projects of important modernist architecture. Those meetings bring to the fore each time just what a complex process it is to bring even a building of relatively recent vintage into the present and future, at once preserving its achievements, architectural, technical, and in all cases social as well, and at the same time, making them at once historically integral and yet relevant and resilient for a new chapter in their lives. Although the prize is given over and over again to buildings that are significant in the history of architecture, it is not the original design, but the skill, foresight, and often perseverance that involves the act of architectural preservation that we honor with this prize. This year's prize winner, John Puddock Associates, for their work on the Preston bus station in Lancashire in the UK is just such a case. Some of you probably never heard of it before, but you're going to all go home uh, and see how much a plane ticket costs to Preston or at least talk about the Preston bus station. Now, each edition of the prize has brought a stronger and stronger field of nominated projects. I've had the pleasure with many of my fellow jurors to be with the prize from the outset. Testament not only, I think, to the growing appreciation of modernist heritage, although it remains an uphill battle, but also to the success of the prize in helping to raise consciousness of this heritage and to gaining public understanding and support for the contributions of innovative architecture of modernism in the 20th century. This year was more difficult than ever, as the range of projects and the ever-widening geographic scope faced us with difficult choices. The whole jury was delighted with the outcome. It might be the seventh prize, but in many ways it achieves a series of firsts. Some of them have already been mentioned. It is the first time a project of the later modernist movement of brutalism has been selected, and I think we'll probably want to talk a bit about that uh, with John and Mabel Wilson, my fellow juror, who's going to join us up here in a moment. It is the first time the project has gone to a British example, even if the architect told us that he was in fact in New York when he won the competition to reconceptualize the public surroundings of the bus station and to restore its major functions. 
its civic place. It is not only the largest project ever to be awarded the prize, but it is also the first to take us into the realm of public infrastructure. Sir Nicholas Pevsner, the German emigre architectural historian to Britain, infamously quipped when asked about the difference between architecture and building, that Lincoln Cathedral is architecture, a bike shed is building. But this monumental bus station, so long neglected and for so long an imminent prospect of demolition, is decidedly public transportation as architecture. Its original architecture again speaks of the civic pride and the social mission of Britain in the 1960s. But Puttick and Associates' restoration also renews the accessibility of the structure, redressing aspects of access. Now I have to resort to the page I forgot to print. Just a minute. Sorry. So redressing aspects of access, not only for those with disabilities, which was much less a concern a half century ago. We just passed in this country the milestone of only 30 years since the passing of the American with Disabilities Act, but also issues of safety, conviviality, and making one of the most democratic of public services, again, a veritable center of daily life in this city and the region it serves. It has always been the concern of the jury that the selected project speaks also as an exemplar. Its story and success providing lessons that can be applied elsewhere and which can serve as inspirations for others in other campaigns to save and report, re restore important structures. John Puttick will no doubt tell us in a few minutes the cast of hundreds who were involved in saving this building, notably such action societies as the 20th Century Society in Britain. The project was on the World Monuments Fund watch list, as Benedict mentioned, a decade ago, and we are all so grateful to John Puttick for his work in bringing it from watch to laureate. Finally, I would say that we had a discussion at one point on the continued meaning of the prize. We have it over and over again. We don't just congratulate ourselves. We question what we're doing. We want to make the prize not only an honor, but a, a, an effective signal. And we wondered even if significant, a significant sustainability agenda might become a more prominent and overt theme. But in fact, in most cases, the careful rejuvenation of an important work of architecture and urban infrastructure is inherently sustainable. Here is a case in which the future art of editing, which must take its place alongside new creativity in our culture of architecture, is the watchword for a meaningful architecture in our world of climate change, emergency, and social challenges. It is a huge pleasure to welcome you to New York, to honor your work in uh, Preston, uh, and after a short video, I'm going to have the, have the honor to give you this heavy glass block to take back to the UK. So we've got a four minute video that will take us on a journey. Designed in 1968 by Keith Ingham and Charles Wilson of the Building Design Partnership with the engineering firm Ova Arabin Partners, the Preston Bus Station is a remarkable example of brutalist architecture and transport planning of the 1960s. When it opened in 1969, it was Europe's largest bus station and epitomized the forward-looking thinking of the period. Brutalism was at once a reaction to modernism of the 20s and 30s with its sleek glass and steel forms and a continuation of its fundamental ethos of creating something of the moment. The Preston bus station is one of the great undersung achievements of that movement in its effort to find a sculptural expression for reinforced concrete, bringing texture to this modern material, at the same time as creating a richness of place for a fundamental civic place of gathering. With over 10,000 departures every week, Preston Bus Station is an extremely busy public building and one of the centers of life in the city. However, by the 1990s, the building had suffered from neglect and inappropriate alterations. Additional seating and freestanding retail units cluttered the once generous spaces, and accumulated signage and advertising detracted from the original design. Colors had been changed, original materials painted over, and the artificial lighting created both uncharacteristic surface fixtures and a dreary atmosphere, leading the building to feel unsafe at night. The station also suffered from considerable structural damage over time, most dramatically when a section of the facade collapsed during high winds. 
After two unsuccessful attempts to secure the building's preservation, international attention was drawn to the site by its inclusion on the 2012 World Monuments Watch. It was finally granted Grade 2 listed building status in 2013, removing the looming threat of demolition. And in 2015, John Puddock Associates was appointed to refurbish this iconic landmark through a competition-winning design. The firm's approach reorients the building by prioritizing pedestrians over vehicles. Bus arrivals are now consolidated to the east, and a major new public square has been created to the west, connected to the city center. Since the public can now approach the building safely at ground level, the below-ground subways were filled in, increasing the sense of safety. Outside, the failing double-height concourse facade has been replaced with glazing and mullions to match the original profile, and the three-dimensional signage system has been reinstated, now reflecting the building's new organization. The interior of the building was rearranged so that generous waiting areas faced the square, and new benches have been made by reusing the original Iroko barriers. The space has also been pared down by removing later interventions, and original materials have been restored, reinstating the powerful design of the 1960s. New interventions, such as the reception and orientation hall, have been carefully detailed to complement the original architecture, while being clearly of the present. In 2008, WMF launched the biennial World Monuments Fund Knoll Modernism Prize, with funding sponsor Knoll, to raise awareness about the urgent threats to modern architecture. The goal was to recognize and support the individuals and organizations that preserve this period's built heritage. This year's edition focuses on sustainable and community-centered approaches to rehabilitating modern buildings. By doing so, we celebrate the power of preservation as a positive force in society. The prize jury valued the detailed and extensive efforts of this project to preserve the full spectrum of historic significance of the station, from its original materials and aesthetic to the building's essential role as a civic center of transit and urban connectivity. The restoration of Preston Bus Station has enhanced both the social and public benefit of the station, and we are thrilled to recognize the outstanding achievements of John Puddock Associates. Congratulations. Congratulations, World Monuments Fund. Great video. Now we have this kind of double, uh, double thing where people are watching online while we're presenting a film to one another. But now I'm going to give you physically the in person of the prize. And congratulations, John. Thank you so much for coming to the audience. And mostly, congratulations to the students and teachers. Thank you. First, I want to begin one welcoming everyone, but also uh, really congratulations on a really remarkable, remarkable pro project, but also contribution, I think, as we discuss to the civic realm. Um, and I am a newbie, as Benedict noted, uh, and it was indeed actually an honor to be on the jury this year. Um, one, because there were just a really amazing group of projects to review and to discuss, but also our conversations, I learned such a great deal about you know, the histories of modernism, but also the ways in which people are attempting to really bring these projects back into some kind of life um, and accessibility. And so you know, the work that the, the award does is, is really, really remarkable. But I wanted to begin with what I think attracted us all to the project, and, and, and that had to do with the kind of intersection of both civic sustainability and ecological sustainability. And I do think it's a really remarkable project in the sense that when it was built in the 60s, that was another moment of social upheaval. You know, this is where we were questioning ecology. You know, and now, 50 years later, we're at another moment. And, and, and one of the questions I had 
was what, it, what, what was it for you to enter into, you know, what was already a civic, a robust civic process, but also maybe rethinking a project like this for the demands of what we know are, are, are the challenges of, of climate change? Okay. Um, well, firstly, I'd just like to say uh, thank you very much to both the World Monument Fund and NOL uh, for the award. Uh, it's really an honor to be here. It's such a pleasure to be in New York. Uh, I haven't left the UK for two years, so it's, it's really brilliant to be here. Um, and I know that everybody in Preston and the whole team that were involved in the project are absolutely delighted. And so many thanks. Uh, their, their acknowledgement means a great deal. Um, I think for your question, uh, let's, if, uh, if I look back, I actually want to start perhaps by saying something about the client, Lancashire County Council. Um, so I think they deserve great credit for uh, deciding to do the project and it was quite controversial at the be beginning in many ways. Uh, they, they backed us strongly as the designers um, and they really kind of followed through. And I think their, their initial aims for the project, the kind of brief we were given, uh, was to try and reconnect the building to the city centre um, in order to promote public transport use and, and obviously to bring the building back to life. Um, so if you look at the, the building as it was designed in the 1960s, um, there are many wonderful things about the building, the kind of expression of it on the skyline, the, the generosity of the spaces, the quality of materials. But I think it really suffered from a sort of 60s view of transport planning where people were kind of relegated to underpasses or a bridge to reach the building. Uh, buses were prioritized, even cars around the site were prioritized. So people were kind of taking their chances to run across the bus concourse to get to the building. Um, so we had the opportunity to create this new public space and connect it through to the city centre. Um, and I think uh, as is sort of very much made clear through the presentations before, um, the building is run in a kind of very generous way and there is this possibility there for all the public to become involved in the building. So we've, we've we, throughout the process we tried to keep that in mind and really bring that to the fore. So the new public space would connect through to a new seating area, new open spaces, um, and that everybody would be able to, to be involved in that. And of course from an environmental perspective, preserving the building is one aspect of that, but also promoting uh, public transport use. I wonder if you would maybe just uh, invitation to narrate a little bit more. Tell us a, a little bit uh, more of the details of essentially changing the, the valence of opinion on this building that many wanted to see removed from the landscape and uh, not si the, what, the, what preceded even undertaking the project, which was to get people on board and decide that this was going to be revivified. Sure. Um, so the, the building has kind of complex history. Uh, there was a 12-year uh, sort of debate as to the future of the building before we were ever involved as architects. Um, in fact, for a very long time, it looked like it would be demolished. Um, the kind of decision whether to preserve the building went to the central government a number of times and, and was turned down. Um, so by the time we got involved, I think um, the building had been listed, so in the UK that gave us the status that it has to be preserved. But there was uh, probably a different, difficult atmosphere maybe around the project, that a, a lot of the people who had been involved uh, on the one side who originally were, were perhaps planning to demolish the building were then suddenly you know, responsible in, in a sense for maintaining it. Um, and some of the groups who'd been campaigning to save the building were suddenly consultees uh, for the planning process to talk about uh, how to preserve it. So um, at the early stage of the project, we were very conscious that uh, we had to try and bring everybody together in detail to discuss um, how to move things forward. Um, and that took place over a se really a series of um, meetings with the local authority, the client, um, the conservation groups, particularly the 20th Century Society um, and Historic England. And I think that process was really very good for everybody involved, including us as architects, because we were quite conscious that there was a responsibility for um, this very important building and the decisions we were taking for it. Um, so the details took, uh, the discussions took place in really a lot of detail. So for example, at the uh, lower part of the facade, we, we replaced the entire two-story facade, as was mentioned before, some of it actually collapsed through um, storms uh, early in the time we were involved. Um, so, for example, the, the doors at the bottom originally were uh, timber-framed doors all throughout. 
I, I think in, in the, even in the 60s and 70s, they were probably always stuck open or closed, but certainly that was true um, by, by the time we, we were working on the project. And the, both the client and the 20th Century Society were very interested to discuss in detail how we would change those, the kind of materials we would use, if we'd be allowed to change them at all. Um, so I think it's really that kind of very detailed process sort of brought people together that they could see that the intentions ultimately were uh, to make the best of the building, uh, bo both on the one, uh, one side to celebrate the original architecture, but also to make it um, a really you know, well-functioning 21st century transport building. I mean, one of the other the, the questions that I had about um, the project, I mean, a little bit of the, the, the video sort of talks about how you change the relationship to the city. Um, and I'm wondering if you could talk more specifically about, you know, what was done with the landscaping. But I'm also curious about the interior, right? Um, because from the description, it sounded like things had been built, you know, into this space. It was cluttered. You know, and how were you thinking about the experience of the, of the commuters and the people who were passing th through that space and how that changed? Um, in, in your design, redesign rather. Okay, um, so to start with the sort of public realm and the landscaping side. So an interesting point about the photographs is that there are very few photos of the public realm, the new, new square. Uh, the reason for that is that was finished slightly after the refurbishment and very soon after it was finished, uh, unfortunately we had the pandemic and there's a big tent uh, now on the site to give vaccinations to the uh, public which on the one hand has sort of messed up our photography, but on the other hand, I think is a, a sort of great, uh, a great use of the site. Yeah, that, I mean, it that shows it's civic importance. And, yeah, yeah, yeah uh, that, that, that they can use it in that way. Um, essentially in Preston, so we've got the, actually the train station is at one end of the high street. There's a high street all the way along and the bus station is located towards the other, other end. So there's a, a kind of wider master plan to create shared uh, spaces, pedestrianized routes through that city center. Um, so we tried to really link the public square, which is on the west side of the building, through to that route. So you'd be able to, be, as a public transport user or anybody on the high street, you could walk all the way along sort of comfortably. Um, as you, you then kind of come out through sort of quite n narrow medieval streets as you approach the bus station, suddenly you kind of burst out into this huge scale uh, public square, which takes up the whole space that used to be one side of the bus apron. So it's really quite dramatic in, in the scale of it. Um, uh, we worked with a landscape architect practice called Planet IE on the des detailed design of that. Um, so there's a kind of green edge to it which separates off what's now a lane just for buses and taxis only. No other uh, vehicles are allowed along there. Um, but otherwise, we kept the space as really this very large scale, open, flexible space. Partly because we felt that the scale of that was suited to the scale of this building and the long views of it was important to preserve them uncluttered and, and the, the sort of design of the landscaping should reflect that sort of very clean approach. Um, but also to provide this sort of flexible space. As you then, talking about the interior of the project, as you move into the building, um, I think uh, the bus station, one thing people don't necessarily know if they haven't been to Preston, uh, they might recognize the building. The building is sort of quite well known in its silhouette. Um, but the way it was designed in the 60s, it's actually a really beautiful human scale design all the way down to small details. Um, so for example, you know, once you, the, the concrete frame has the kind of larger mega sort of scale. As you get into that, there's a finer scale through the, uh, the glass and aluminium facade and so on. And then it comes down to sort of elements that you touch. So there's a Roco timber is used throughout for the bus barriers, all the doors you touch. Um, the staircase handrails and things. So there's a kind of warmth to that and a, like a, a very human scale of design. Um, so I think in, the, in terms of the interior, that's the quality we really try to draw out. Um, on the west side of the building, we removed the original barriers that kind of divided it into a series of bus pens and we actually turned those on their sides so they're now seating. So we're both able to reuse the material uh, but, but reconfigure the use of the space. And then where we put in new elements, so there's a new sort of pod that supports a 24-hour coach station. Um, it, it gives a new, there was amazingly no, no central information point for the building before. Uh, so it creates an information point. And that, we've tried to make that sort of clearly contemporary. It, it doesn't look like it was built in the 60s, but uh, hopefully it has some of the same kind of utilitarian simplicity to it. And again, we took the chance to reuse some of the timber on the parts of that people, people would touch. 
Um, and the, the lighting has completely changed, I think was mentioned earlier, and that, that really, I think, in a very simple way, just makes the building feel much more open and safe. I'm trying to imagine if there was a great public square and landscape in front of Port Authority. Imagine how different 42nd Street would be. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, don't go there looking for inspiration. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm completely, I'm going to reveal my, uh, my roots as a historian of 19th century architecture. There was a competition, 1844, to choose the restoration architect to restore Notre Dame Cathedral. And I have always found the notion that you would have a, de a, a design competition for a restoration as a, 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 as a curiosity. So since you won this project from New York, we found out, um, in a competition, I wonder, of course, you never know the full picture of a competition when you're a competitor, but I wonder what you can tell us about the competition and to what ex what do you do you know about the range of projects but also what do you think were the criteria that that jury was looking for that they chose your project was it actually the new design features the landscape or were there aspects of what you proposed to do in restoration that were you know in competition with other people's ideas yeah uh, so there were more than a hundred entries to the competition um, so it's, it's, and obviously I wasn't involved really, so it's kind of hard for me to say. Um, we, uh, we were asked to look at three aspects for the project, the, uh, sort of connecting the building to the city centre and the public space, restoring the building, and uh, originally there was an, another component which was a new build uh, centre for young people. Um, so that, that, uh, that ultimately didn't go ahead as part of the final project. Um, so the competition was in two stages. I think the first stage to get into the shortlist was really probably a matter of um, some kind of very clear ideas about the level to which you'd preserve the building, how the, the basic sort of urban planning arrangement, and then obviously the kind of new build part, which, which is not there anymore. Um, when we got into the shortlist, the second stage of the competition was actually very, very complex and thorough. So we had to make submissions about uh, the way we'd carry out public consultations, for example, and how to involve the public I in the design process. Uh, we had to write about future maintenance of the building, both the, the new design and, and the original building. Uh, we had to sort of do a kind of historic analysis of the existing building and how our design would respond to that. So it was really a very thorough submission, I think, process, which wasn't about okay, this is one view, you know, here, here's what it will look like from the West or something. Um, so what I've heard from the people who were on the jury is that the, uh, in the end it was being able to sort of confidently deal with all those different uh, criteria and different points. Um, but there, were, there was also some other things, so there was a public vote, they, they displayed I think the final six projects in the, in the bus station itself and there was a public vote. Um, so there, there were many aspects to it, but uh, yeah, happily, happily we got there. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, one, it's great to hear that the public was involved in the process of selection, you know, and that the site itself, clearly, you know, if there is a COVID testing site um, or, you know, um, vaccination site, I, I think it's remarkable. What, how has the public responded to the project thus far? Um, I, my impression is it's, it's a, seen as a very positive change. Um, I think the... The building, from a, a sort of general public's point of view in Preston, was very much loved and hated in a way. Um, a lot of people very much appreciate the building. A lot of people really thought it was a heavy, difficult, unsafe place that uh, they would like to see demolished. Um, so I think the, the balance has very much changed in, in favour of the former now. Um, it, it is so much easier to get into, it is so much brighter and safer, so even if you're not a brutalism fan, let's say, um, it, it's, it, it's a nicer place to go. And I think um, in, in the end that's something that's been really important about the project is that obviously there's a side to it which is about uh, you know, a brutalist building and, and the importance of that as an architectural moment in time. Um, but also it's just a very busy transport building and it, and it really can make a contribution to people's lives every day. Uh, that it's that it's a better place to be. I thought maybe we should, because there is a reception waiting for us, um, open it up if there were questions or comments from the audience. I think there's a roving mic. I'm curious about the original architect. 
It's cited in any way. Is that a question for the jury or for the, the laureate? <laughs> I, I can answer a little bit from the 12 years of perspective on the jury. It's always been, we always have to remind ourselves that we're not awarding a design prize for a building that may be anywhere from almost 100 now to, um, in fact, I think we did have a housing project in the Netherlands that was right around World War I, the earliest project, this one of the most recent, that we're not giving a retrospective. It's not like the AIA 50 Years Award, which essentially says, congratulations, it was a great building, then it's still a great building. Um, it really is a prize about restoration and then therefore to send the, the messages. Now, clearly, it's not quite so clear cut as that if the building didn't appear to the jury to be of significance to begin with, the significance of the restoration would be uh, much less compelling. Um, but then on the other hand, I don't think something like Preston Bus Station, as monumental as it is, is probably well known even to architectural historians outside of Britain. Um, so it probably shines a new light on the, the work of, of Arup and the others who were involved in the 1968 to 69 design. So that was just from the official point of view, maybe you have thoughts on it. Yeah, I mean, I think the building was very well celebrated actually when it was first built. Um, so it, it was very well published and uh, it's certainly well recognized in the UK, which, which partly when we became involved make, made it quite controversial. Because on the one side, while there are a lot of people that disliked it, on the other side, there are a lot of people who really loved everything about it and, and very much wanted to, to keep everything. Um, the original architects did an extraordinary job of the building. Uh, it's not to criticize them because the thinking around transport, let's say, has changed. Um, and in fact, I think it would have been impossible to renovate uh, another building um, in the way that we did here without the high quality of materials and detailing uh, that were originally put into the project. And it's really because of that that we were able to, to bring it back to, to life in, in this way. Part of the history of this building is that it was, fell into disrepair and that the government, the local governments, were reluctant to restore it and that it was a, a candidate for demolition for some time. Uh, and then the story goes to, and then the building was listed. How did it get from being uh, a building that was unpopular with the powers that be to being suddenly a gem that needed protection? Uh, so this is a 12 year story from the, the, the two points that you're talking about. Um, and I, I wasn't involved in that, so I can only kind of give a sketch of really what happened. Um, so the building, uh, there were local campaign groups who wanted to keep the building and there were uh, kind of um, more national bodies, the 20th Century Society being the most significant one, who uh, were campaigning for a very long time to keep the building. Um, and it went right the way up to ministerial level with the central government at least twice, and the government minister turned it down uh, for listing, which would have preserved the building. Then at some point it came up as a question to the minister in an interview saying, what about Preston bus station? And he gave a sort of soft reply saying, oh yes, I know that's a very important building, people care a lot about it, it's unlikely to be listed. Um, and then it wasn't too long after that, the 20th Century Society gave one more try to list the building uh, and, and it happened and it was accepted. So I, I guess there was perhaps a gradual change in perception. Um, also locally, the uh, forces around demolishing it, there'd been previously a plan to build a, essentially a kind of big retail project on the site. And the whole commercial thinking about that changed after 2008. So I think that also, in a, in a kind of practical way, changed the, the uh, sort of ideas locally of what you might do with that site. Yeah, and I just wanted to add um, that one, that was one of the things that the jury recognized and, and, and wanted to sort of um, 
honor with the award was that it actually was a civic process and that there were groups, especially at a moment where civil society is somewhat under siege, that this project really serves as a model you know, for other municipalities and community groups in terms of saving these kinds of projects around, literally around the world. First and foremost, congratulations. I think the project is amazing, and thank you for coming to New York to tell us all about it. But I'm curious, with respect to the future of the building, has consideration been given to the use of electric vehicles and how electric vehicles are going to be serviced uh, in the station through the infrastructure that you created? Do you mean as in terms of electric cars? To electric cars and buses, exactly. Uh, I mean, I think for buses, so the, um, the east side, conversely to where the public space is, the east side of the building remains the bus parking uh, and the bus bays, which have been reconfigured. And there was quite a lot of work done with the highways people to look at future kinds of vehicles and how they could be accommodated and so on. So from a bus point of view, uh, I think that will, that will be allowed for in the current design. Uh, the car park itself is really essentially still just left simply as a car park. It's been refurbished. Uh, in terms of you know protecting the concrete, making it easier to get around, but there had there haven't been um, electric bays installed. Um, that's something perhaps you know that should be addressed in the future. Uh, I totally agree. Um, we have created a lot more cycle parking to try and encourage people to cycle to the building and then take the bus for a longer journey uh, from there. So there's some kind of joined up thinking about how you can move shorter and longer distances. I think for electric buses, for charging stations for cars, that would have to be a, another layer of implementation. It happens that I began my own architectural career working in London shortly after this building opened. And I worked for a, a major firm in London that specialized in what you would call brutalist buildings using large-scale prefab concrete elements. So this building has some particular interest to me. And maybe I can ask you some questions privately. But the picture that's actually oh, just went off the board, but it's the center fold of this uh, book, has a little detail in it that's been vexing me. And it might be a humorous way for us to end these questions. I see the 30, number 33 illuminated spot uh, identifying a bus uh, location, but there's no corresponding gate at ground level. It jumps from 32 to 34, and I was just wondering if there's something, a little hidden Easter egg in this design. Yeah. Now, that's a really good point. Now, I've almost forgotten what the reason for that was. I think the original building had 40 bus bays down each side. And in the reorganized east um, uh, sort of bus apron, there's actually 33 bus bays uh, that kind of that come into it with the, new, with the size of the new buses and so on that were needed today. So we wanted to keep the original numbering down the inside 1 to 40. So there are still, it's still that numbering's c consistent, and as a member of the public, that's what you see but it doesn't ultimately need every single one of them outside. So there's some that are jumped in order that you, you kind of don't need to worry. I, I think it's fair to say nobody's ever spotted that before. In, uh, so co congratulations on your uh, question. questions and uh, what I think is I like this new format of the conversation is very interesting because um, it I think shows how these projects and the work that's done on them really um, in a sense is at the intersection of so many themes and so many issues and there's so much more that we haven't been able to address I'd love to have a, a an urban and social historian tell us about the demographic changes that have happened in Preston over 50 years uh, but um, it's been for, for me a very uh, stimulating follow-up to our admiration for this project. A great chance to meet you. Thank you so much for coming over. Um, and we happily did not give you a medal prize, which would have led to a holdup at JFK Airport Security. This glass will go right through, and um, we hope you will.
We all hope to get to Preston, and we hope you will continue to want to come back to New York. But congratulations on the, on the prize, and thank you so much for being with us. And thank you all of those of you who came out tonight to the Center for Architecture and to people who are online. Did you want to say a last word, Benedict? No. I want to thank you for preparing this event tonight. I want to thank and congratulate once again uh, John Pollock Associates. And uh, hopefully the next edition will be in two years and we very much hope to continue our partnership with NOL because we, we, we will renew and continue our commitment to uh, modern architecture. We think it's really sometimes under-recognized but can be a very positive force in society. So thank you all. And I hope you will join us uh, now for our glass to celebrate. Thank you.